Good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And uh, thank you for coming to the study here uh, this evening. But before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have to study, and we're grateful for the Sabbath hours, for the blessings that we can receive through the study of your word, and as we share with one another. Uh, the thing is that you are speaking to our hearts through your spirit. We ask, Lord, now that as we um, look at um, the message of righteousness by faith as presented by Father A.T. Jones, we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can help us to discern truth from error, uh, that we can understand uh, the words that have been spoken in the past, and that we can see the application of those words to us in the present. We pray for each person that you can bless them, and that they can be encouraged by the things that we are going to study this evening. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath again. And um, this is going to be our 32nd study. Um, on the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And we just have a bit more of Jones to go through. I think there's this one and another one, or maybe a, a three more, counting this one, I'm not sure. But um, this this study here is, he's, he's going to be dealing with some important points. But before we begin to look at, at this, um, I just want to look at a statement in the spirit of prophecy that Heidi and I read um, in our morning worship. And I, I thought it was rather interesting. This is from Nine Testimonies, uh, page 182. And um, these, this relates to righteousness by faith, but a number of other points that are here as well that I think are important to, to look at. So Ellen White says, there are those here upon whom great light in warnings and reproofs has shone. Whenever reproofs are given, the enemy seeks to create in those reproved a desire for human sympathy. Therefore, I would warn you to beware lest in appealing to the sympathy of others and going back over your past trials, you again err on the same points in seeking to build yourselves up. We can all relate to this. Um, so when God reproves us, and sometimes we don't seek them, but there are people who actually uh, try to give sympathy when you know that reproof is is actually deserved. And so it's it's important that we recognize. Um, the importance of being reproved when God reproves us and also not to seek human, human sympathy. The Lord brings his erring children over the same ground again and again, and we've all experienced that. But if they continually fail to heed the admonitions of his spirit, if they fail to reform on every point where they have erred, he will finally leave them to their own weakness. So that's not something that we want to experience. We want to, don't want to be left to our own weakness because that's pretty weak. I entreat you, brethren, to come to Christ and drink. Drink freely of the water of salvation. Do not appeal to your own feelings. Do, do not think that sentimentalism is religion. Now, I've always think I've, I've never been a sentimental person, um, especially in religion, but, um, you know, all of us have, you know, been to sermons where, uh, the preacher can, em can emote in us, um, some kind of sentiment where we can maybe shed a few tears. And for many people, that's what they believe religion is. If they're touched by the sermon, 
that somehow that makes them religious. But Ella White says, do not think that sentimentalism is religion. Shake yourself from every human prop and lean heavily upon Christ. You need a new filling up before you are prepared to engage in the work of saving souls. Your words, your actions have an influence upon others, and you must meet that influence in the day of God. Jesus says, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Light is shining from that door, and it is our privilege to receive it if we will. Um, let us direct our eyes within the open door and try and receive all that Christ is willing to bestow. So we, we have this open door that no man can shut, Revelation 3, verse 8. You know, that's the message to uh, the Philadelphian church. So we've looked at the light that's shining from that door. And that light is going to be a light of reproof. So we need to look into that open door. Now, Ellen White then says, each one will have a close struggle to overcome sin in his own heart. This is at times a very painful and discouraging work because as we see the deformities of our character, we keep looking at them. When we should look to Jesus and put on the robe, of his righteousness. Everyone who enters the pearly gates of the city of God will enter there as a conqueror and his greatest conquest will have been the conquest of self. And this is really why we're studying not just Joan's uh, presentations, but everything that we're studying is light that is meant to help us see, see our need to bring conviction, but we don't focus upon our deformities of character. We don't look to those. We look to Christ. And that's what we see in everything that we've been studying, is that our focus is taken off of self and placed upon Christ. We have to we have to see something of ourselves so we can take it to Christ, you know. Yeah, so that's why we're reproved, right? So we get this message of reproof. We see our sins, but we can't con constantly just focus upon our deformities of character, in character, in our character. We, we can't just keep looking on those because that can bring discouragement. What we have to see is we are sinners. We should know that. We should believe what God says about us. But we can trust in Christ. This is the message that Joan has been giving. And, and we know that this message of Jones has been uh, perverted. That is, it's been redefined. So, you know, the in Christ motif, where we're just in Christ, we're perfect. Um, without really any battle with self. And that's the, that's the other extreme. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's an extreme that has has co-opted the language of scripture and given it a different meaning. And so it can be quite deceptive. Yeah. So I just thought that, that those statements there in nine testimonies were that was pretty powerful uh, for what we have been studying. So this is um, Third Angel's message number 17. And Joan says, the last verse that we had before us in the previous lesson was the third chapter of Galatians, verses 13 and 14. Now, whether that be the promise of the spirit to the individual in his own individual experience or the promise of the spirit in its outpouring on the whole church, it is all the same. Nobody can have it without having the blessing of Abraham first. Whoever has not the blessing of Abraham cannot have the Holy Spirit. Because we read in Romans 4, he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised. So if we go back to what he was talking about, uh, we're, we're looking at Galatians. Uh, 
chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. That's what he had, uh, we had been studying last week. And we can see that Abraham is um, both a, an example of faith to the uncircumcised as well as to the circumcised, because he was declared as righteous prior to being circumcised. He received the righteousness by faith prior to being circumcised. So the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. So this is Paul's argument, and Jones has directed us to that. And then Jones says, What's, what circumcision really is, you will find by turning to the 30th chapter of Deuteronomy and the 6th verse. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. Now put right, put right with that Romans 5.5. 5. After telling that we are justified by faith and that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Then he says, verse 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which was given unto us. Now, unto us, the Holy Ghost sheds abroad in the heart the love of God. But he said here, I will circumcise thine heart to love the Lord thy God, with all thine heart and with all thy soul. And the only way that we can love the Lord with all the heart and with all the soul is by the love of God implanted in the heart and in the soul, converting the person to God. And love is the fulfilling of the law. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength is the first of all the commandments. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Circumcision of the heart is that condition of the heart by which we will love the Lord, our God, with all the heart and with all the soul. And you see that that which this circumcision in the flesh was to Abraham was simply a sign, a token, that they could see in the time when God was teaching them by object lessons, a token which they could see, signifying that that which they could not see. And therefore, that circumcision in the flesh being a sign, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had before he was circumcised, it was simply the sign outwardly of the work of the Holy Spirit, which circumcised the heart. The Holy Spirit sheds abroad the love of God in the heart, but no man, can receive the promise of the Spirit, who is not the blessing of Abraham, the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Then the man who knows that he believes God can ask with perfect confidence for the Holy Spirit, not the man who thinks that he believes God. A part of the time he does, a part of the time he does not. A part of the time he thinks he does, a part of the time he does not know whether he does or not. And that is not believing God at all. But the Lord wants you and me to know that we believe God. He wants us to know that and to have that thing as firmly settled and fixed as that we live. And I say that the man who knows that he believes God can ask with perfect confidence for the spirit of God and receive it by faith. For if ye ask, ye shall receive. He said so. But we must, must ask according to his will. But it is not according to his will to give the Holy Spirit to anybody who has not the blessing of Abraham. And just as with the individual, so with the church. When the people of God reach that place where they know that they believe God, they can ask with perfect confidence for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and wait in perfect confidence and faith that they shall receive it. And they will. That is a fact. Now let us study a little further tonight how we may know that the blessing of Abraham is our own and how we may know that with 
that with perfect confidence, we may ask the Lord to give us his Holy Spirit and then just simply wait his own good time and we receive it according to his own wish. We have not anxiety about whether we are going to receive it or not. We want to learn how all that anxiety as to whether we can receive the Holy Spirit or not, learn how that can be taken away from us and then we can present our petitions to the Lord in faith, expecting to receive it, expecting just that and expecting nothing else and simply waiting for him to give it in his own good time while we still ask and still seek him that it may be so. So Jones is going to show how we can have confidence. And we address that a little bit in, in our study on 1 John. And, and of course, he's going to go in that same direction. I tell you, brethren, when we get into that place, it will not be difficult for us to be with one accord in one place. Now, at this meeting, when we reach that condition, that place where we know that we believe God and know that we may ask with perfect confidence for the Holy Spirit, it will be an easy thing for every one of us, and it will be so too, to be with one accord in one place every time there is a meeting. The fact of the matter is each one will be afraid to be away because if he should be away from any one of the, these meetings and the promise of the Holy Spirit be fulfilled, he would miss it. Everyone will be here waiting and watching for the Lord to do what he says, just when he gets ready. Don't you see how that will bring all with all with accord into one place? It will do it. Of course, if the work of the Lord should call us away from some meeting in order to, of our work in the order of the Lord and the Holy Spirit should be poured out, while we were away, we would get it anyhow, wherever we went, wherever we were. But it will not be so with those who are away from the meeting from their own inclinations. I'm afraid to be away from any of our, our meetings here. I'm afraid to be away from these morning meetings. For I can't tell you what meeting the Spirit may be poured upon us. I cannot risk being absent. Now let us take up the scriptures and read just how the Lord has led us. And we'll lead everyone right through to that place. Tonight, if you will go. If you will start where I begin to read, the Lord will lead you and me right straight through. Let us not question how that can be. When the Lord speaks, that is the end of the whole story. No difference. What he says, that is the end of it. And we, shut, and we say, Lord, that's so. Now let us go together tonight and we will arrive at that place where every one of us can know that we believe God and that we have the blessing of Abraham. And then we can ask God for his spirit in perfect confidence and wait to receive it as he gives it in his own good time. Let us see what the Lord has done and how he works and how he brings us up to that place. Let us begin where he began. We will read first from Ephesians 1 verse 3 to 6. And that takes us to the point where God began concerning us. And that will be as far back as we need to go. The third verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And what is it he hath done? Congregation, blessed us. Is it so? Congregation, yes. Has he done it? Congregation, yes. He has blessed us with how many blessings? Congregation, all spiritual blessings. All the blessings he has. He has given us all? Congregation, yes. How? Congregation in Christ, in Christ. Then in giving Christ, what did God give? Congregation, all spiritual blessings. All the spiritual blessings that he had. Well then, when you and I believe in Jesus Christ, are we not blessed? Have not we all the blessing that the Lord has? Then what is going to bother us? A person that is blessed like that, is he going to be anything else than happy? Congregation, no. Can he have the blues? Congregation, no. Can he get into the salts because things don't go just right? Congregation, no. They're just, they, they are going just right anyway. However things go, they can't take his blessings away. All things work together for good to them that love God. But the fourth verse is the one particularly that I want to read. According as he hath chosen us, Will choose us? Congregation hath chosen us. Has he? Congregation, yes. 
When did he do it? Congregation, before the foundation of the world. Thank the Lord. Before the foundation of the world, he chose you and me. Congregation, praise the Lord. Now, will you say amen to that every time? Congregation, amen. I do not mean just now. Will you say it all the time? Congregation, yes. How long is that scripture going to remain there? Congregation, forever. And how long is it going to be true that he hath chosen you before the foundation of the world? Congregation, always. Then how long are you going to be bothered to know whether you are the Lord's or not? Hasn't he chosen you? Hasn't he chosen you? Congregation, yes. What did he do it for? Because he wanted us, did he? Congregation, yes. He chose me because he wanted me, and he shall have me. I'm not going to rob him and disappoint his choice. He has chosen us, hasn't he? Congregation, yes. Before the foundation of the world. Now, the rest of that verse, that he should be holy and without blame before him in love, his blessed purpose is he wants us to be holy and without blame before him in love. Then we can let him have his own way because it is our everlasting salvation to let him do it. Next verse. Having predestinated, appointed the destiny that he wants us to reach long beforehand. The destiny that God fixes for man is worth having, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Why did he do it then? Not because we were so good, but because he is so good, not because we were so well pleasing to him, but because of the good pleasure of his own will. It was just himself to do it. That's why he did it. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now, what do you say to that, congregation? Amen. When did he do that, congregation? Before the foundation of the world. Precisely. Before the foundation of the world. That answers all this idea about whether we can do anything in order to be justified or not. He did it all before we had any chance to do anything. Long before we were born, long before the world was made. Don't you see that the Lord is the one that does things in order that we may be saved and that we may have him. Now see what he has done. First, he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. Two, he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Three, he hath pre predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. Four, and he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Well, I'm glad of it. I know that that is so, congregation, amen. Don't you, congregation, yes. For he says so, he says so. Here then are four things that we can be everlastingly sure of. A word further about those blessings the Lord hath given us. We have all the blessing that God has when we believe in when we believe Jesus Christ, then they are our own. We don't need to be so very particular about praying for blessings. We Would we not do better, think ye, to spend our time in thanking him for the blessings that we have than in asking him for blessings? How does that look? Which do you think looks the better, to thank the Lord for the blessings he has already given or to ask him to give us some? when he hasn't any more to give. Now, which is the better congregation to thank him? He hath given us all blessings, all the blessings that he has in Christ. Christ says, I am with you, brethren. Let us feed on the blessings. We have them and they are our own. Then we can be sure all the time that we have all spiritual blessings. We can be sure all the time that he has chosen us. Chosen us. He says he has. We can be sure all the time that he has predestinated us unto the adoption of children. We can be sure of all the, um, we can be sure all the time that he has made us accepted in the beloved. We can be sure of all these things for God says so, and it is so. Then isn't that a continual feast itself? Now he has done all that and has done it freely. 
For how many people did he do this? Congregation, all. Every soul? Congregation, yes, sir. Gave all the blessings he has to every soul in the world. He has chosen every soul in the world. He chose him in Christ before the foundation of the world. Predestinated him unto the adoption of children. And made him accepted in the beloved. Did he not? Congregation, yes. Of course he did. We will read other verses on that presently. The thought I am after just now is that no one can have these things and know they are his without his own consent. The Lord will not force any of these things upon a man, even though he has given them already, will he? Congregation, no. This is a cooperation, you see. God pours out everything in one wondrous gift. But if a man will not have it, the Lord will not compel him to have a bit of it. Every man that will take it, it is all his own. There is, there is where the cooperation comes in. The Lord has, has to have our cooperation, cooperation in all things. Now, I want to touch here on a point. Um, so, um, I'm trying to think of the guy's name. Uh, from the 1888 message study committee. Oh, so that names. Um, hmm. He wrote that book that Jeff responded to. I just can't think of it. Um, anybody know who I'm talking of? He's a neighbor. Of, yeah, uh, really? Uh, Jack Sakira. Yeah, yeah, Jack, he did Blind Belief. He's, he wrote Blind Belief. Yeah. Now, um, you know, Jack Sakira tried to argue that, you know, every man is justified because he, they try to argue that this is what um, Jones is saying. Now, can a man be justified without his cooperation? Because aren't we, aren't we justified by faith? You know, Christ died for all men, and this would include all men in the past and all men in the future, any man who ever has lived or could live. So we know he's he's offered this free gift to all men, but men have to take it. Now, this argument that he justified all men, what's what's the problem with it? What what is the problem with what Jack Sakira was teaching beyond belief in the book Beyond Belief? He was saying that everybody was saved until they sinned. Okay. Um yeah, that's probably part of it. Um, but, you know, that that basically Jesus saved all men, that all men are justified. I mean, that's really the main argument. And, and the problem with that is, you know, as we pointed out, there needs to be cooperation. But if all men are justified, um, what would that mean? I mean... Sometimes these arguments can be, you know, arguing over definitions of words. But if all men are made righteous, that is, their past sins have been forgiven, um, what would be the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian in that regard? Probably not much. If we've all are justified. Yeah. And we know that... That justification comes by faith, that at some point in my life, I experienced justification by faith. There was a point in my life where I did it. And so, you know, sometimes people talk about the provision is made for all men and different things like this. But the reality is Christ died for all men and he's offering a free gift to all men, whosoever will. Let him take of the water of life freely. But can we have the water of life if we don't take of it? As, 
No. We can't have the water unless we take it. Yeah, and and we're not and go, and Christ is not going to force it upon us. Right, as Joan says, the Lord will not force any of these things upon a man, even though he has given them already. Right? So God isn't about to force us. And in order for us to have the water of life, we have to take it. We have to choose whom we will serve. We have to acknowledge by faith. We have to. Now, this doesn't give any merit to, to hum, humankind, to mankind, in taking of the water of life. We're not meriting salvation by accepting a free gift. If somebody offers me a free gift and I take it, did I earn it? No, of course not. No, it's a free gift. I, I did nothing to earn it. No. I have to take it. This is where you respond. Your response. Your choice to accept it. And the idea is that, you know, God has justified all men. Um, if he's only justified all men, I mean, what would be the difference between uh, those that are saved and those that are lost? If they're all justified, how can they be? lost so often this leads to a type of universalism and and we've seen this type of thing uh, creep up in adventism through different different ways because god is love he wants everyone to be saved so everyone will be saved because god wills that all should, all men shall be saved can can people go against god's will Yes, they can, most certainly. Yeah. And, and God allows that, because God has to allow that, right? But he's put a choice before us. He's given us free will. Without God, free will would not be a possibility. We would just be animals with instinct. We couldn't be saved or lost. Okay, now let us turn to Titus 2.14. Speaking of the Lord, it says, who gave himself for us. That is the past tense too, is it not? That is done. He did give himself for how many people? Congregation, all. How many people on the earth can read that text and say, that means me, every soul on the earth? Wherever we go then on this earth and find a man, we can read to him that Christ gave himself for you. Can we not? Congregation, yes. He gave himself for you then. That is the price that Peter refers to in 1 Peter 1, verse 18 to 20. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained, before the foundation of the world. Now we want each individual to know where he stands. He gave himself for me. That is stated in Galatians 2.20. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. How many people in the world can read that and say that means me? Congregation, everyone. Loved me and gave himself for me. That was the price that was paid, and then he bought me, did he? Congregation, yes. He bought you? Congregation, yes. Whether you or I let him have us, that is not the question just now, right? So he's not really addressing that question, which I've already addressed. What has he done? What did he do? Congregation paid the price. Before the foundation of the world, he bought me, did he not? And you? And whose are we? Congregation, the Lord's. Well, then, is there any prospect of your getting into doubt as to whether you are the Lord's? How is a man who wants to be the Lord's and has confessed his sins, how is it possible for him to get into doubt 
as to whether he is the Lord's or not. It is only by going back on the word of God altogether and not believing in it all and saying the Lord has lied. Is not that the only way he can do it? He that believeth God, believeth not God, has made him a liar. Then the only way a man can doubt as to whether he is the Lord's or not is by going back on the word of God and saying that the Lord lies. That is the only way he can do it. Because for a man to doubt, because for a man to, to doubt is to do that, he may not do that in so many words, but when he gets into doubt as to whether he is the Lord's, that is what he has done. He has allowed unbelief to overthrow him and Satan to get the advantage and sweep away, uh, sweep everything away. That is so. But still, though, the Lord has bought us. He will not take what he has bought without our permission. There is a line which God has set as fixing the freedom of every man, and he himself will never go over that line a hair's breadth without our permission. He respects the freedom and dignity which he has given to intelligent creatures, whether man or angel. He respects it, and he himself will not transgress the limit. He will not go over the limits without the permission of that person. But when the permission is given, then he will come for all that he, he is. Then that opens the floodgates and the Lord flows in. That is so. Well then, he has bought you. Has he? Congregation, yes. And do you want to be the Lord's? Congregation, yes. Now, friends, let us make this a real, practical, tangible thing. He has bought us, has he not? He has paid the price for us. We are his by his will. Now then, when our will is there, whose are we then? Congregation, the Lord's. He has shown his will on that subject by paying the price, has he not? Has he not? And when we make known our will on the subject by saying, Lord, that is my choice too. That is the way my will goes, too. And I want to know how in the universe anything is going to keep us from being his. And can you know that you are the Lord's? Congregation, yes, sir. Can you now? Congregation, yes, sir. Well, suppose you get up in the morning with a headache and your digestion has not worked very well during the night and you feel rather bad all over and don't feel just right. How do you know you are the Lord's? congregation because he says so but suppose you get up in the morning and feel bright and hilarious and feel pretty good generally and how do you know you are the lord's congregation because he says so sometimes people say when we ask them have your sins been forgiven yes i was convinced that they were for a while what convinced you i felt as though they were forgiven uh, they did not know anything about it they did not in that have a particle of evidence that their sins were forgiven my brethren, the only evidence that we can have that these things are so is that God says so. That is the evidence. Don't look to feelings. Feelings are as variable as the wind. You know that is so. Never pay a particle of attention to them. It is none of your business how you feel. When God says so, it is so, whether I feel so or not. I will give that illustration again. I've given it before, but it emphasizes the point that feeling has nothing to do with facts. Twice two is four, is it not? You know that it is so, but there are some people in the world who do not know that twice two is four. But suppose you should tell someone and he should believe it. How do you think he would feel? Do you suppose he would feel as though he had been picked up and whirled in a sort of a half somersault and set down in a new place? No. What in the world has feeling got to do with that? Then what does he care how he feels? Now, that is not saying that there will be no experience as the fruit of this. But it is saying that if you look to feelings as an evidence, you will never find the evidence. But if you look to the word of God for the evidence, then you will get the evidence which God gives in his word. That is, his own divine power 
in that word, effectually working in the man who believes. Well then, the Lord has bought us, has he not? Now, as far as you and I are concerned, we need not have any more doubt as to whether we are the Lord's. That is so? Congregation, yes. But there are some people in the world who are not really in real experience. And as a matter of fact, so far as the cons consummation of the bargain is concerned, they have not submitted themselves to the Lord and are not practically his. He has made them his purchase, made him, made them his by purchase. Now, how can they know that they are his practically and indeed by his word? by choosing for themselves to have it just that way, by choice. Page 44 in Steps to Christ gives the whole philosophy of it. It tells how to make the surrender of ourselves to God. It says that your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. And the knowledge of your broken promise and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity. And finally, what you need to understand Understand is that the true force of the will. You cannot serve your save yourself. You cannot change your heart, but you can choose to serve him. When a man chooses to put his will on the side where God's will is, then the thing is accomplished. Then it is at a man's choice that he practically, in his own experience, becomes the Lord's indeed. Then is it not by the man's own permission? in choosing the Lord's way, that the man becomes the Lord's in a practical experience. Now, sometimes this is misunderstood. People think that this is sort of like willpower. But God has given us a free choice, and that's the only thing that he can't do for us. He can't choose for us. So who is going to choose for us? Who's the only person that can choose for us? Uh, us. us, right? Us. And do we have the power of choice according to God's word? Yeah. God could not say, choose ye this day whom ye shall serve, if we didn't have the power of choice. And the very fact that God tells us that we can choose means that we can choose. Somebody can't say, I don't have the power of choice. Right? Right. The word of God comes to us and says, choose. That means we have the power to choose. And there's no reason why we shouldn't choose. And we could argue that, well, I can't choose, or I'm making this choice, and we can make excuses why we choose something a certain way. But aren't we making God a liar when we say we, we can't choose God? Yeah. yeah. So we can choose. And we have that, that choice always before us. We can either choose to believe and trust in God. Or we can choose not to. So Jones goes on, he says, then having done that, don't you see that so long as your choice is there, so long as your wish is there to be the Lord's, don't you see that you are the Lord, are the Lord's indeed? Do you see that? Whenever we deliver ourselves up to him, that is so. But some of you delivered yourselves yourself up long ago. But then, since that, you've been discouraged and wondering whether you were the Lord's or not. But we want people tonight to get that doubt and question forever out of the way so that whatever comes up, you will not be bothering about whether you are the Lord's. Just as certainly as your choice is there to be his, you are his, for he bought you long ago. And that is the thing I'm after. Is that what you are after? You are to take it if you ever get it. Congregation, amen. Then we can know that we are the Lord's. But now we sometimes hear people talk as though this was going to sanction sin. No, it will not do that. No, it will save you from sinning. 
When a man gets into that place and his choice is there to be the Lord's, then God works in him both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. And he is a Christian. God will make him a Christian. That is the divine power there is in this thing. There's no sanction of sin about it. In fact, it is the only way to keep from sanctioning sin. Any other profession does sanction sin. Any other profession does, does do just what the Lord complains of, that men have made him to serve with their sins. What does the Lord say? You have made me to serve with your sin, Isaiah 43, 24. Let us stop it. Let our will and our choice be the Lord's every moment of our conscious days. Then it is the fact. Let us turn and read that verse that says so. 1 Corinthians 6.19 and the last words of the verse. Ye are not your own. That is so, is it not? I don't care what who the man is. Is he is is he his own congregation? No, sir. The Lord has bought him, and if he does not let the Lord have him, he is robbing the Lord of that which is the Lord's own. That is the mischief of, of it. Though he be not consciously and practically the Lord's, yet the Lord has bought every one. And any man who refuses to let the Lord have him, he is robbing the Lord of that which he bought and for which he paid the price. And he is counting the price which bought him as worth less than himself. Is not that the same satanic spirit that sought to put itself above God in heaven? The Lord gave himself for us. Then when then. When I will not let him have me, in that very thing, I count myself worth more than the price that was paid. That is worth more than the Lord. And that is the same self that puts itself above God at the all the time. Oh, let this mind be in you or be in us that was in Christ, who emptied himself that God and man might be united in one. You are not your own, are you, congregation? No. Are you not glad of it? Are you not glad you are your own? You are not your own? He says so, and it is so. Is it not? Why is it? For ye are bought with a price. He bought us, therefore. We are not our own. And before all people in the world who are not their own is the man who has yielded himself to the Lord who has bought him. Therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. Whose are they? Congregation of God's. But I need not dwell longer on these verses, brethren. You do that, will you? You dwell on them. Well, now I have read the verses. He gave himself for us. He bought us. How much of us? Congregation. All of us. And when was it that he did it? Congregation before the foundation of the world. And what kind of folks were we before the foundation of the world? What kind of folks were we when God bought us? We were just ourselves, just as we were in this world. And he bought us, sinners, just as we are. Congregation, yes. Now, did he, honestly now, we are coming to another thought here. How did he pay that, that price and buy us just as we were, sinners? Congregation, yes. Evil beings... And willing to go into evil ways, willing to do the evil thing, making no profession of religion and not particularly wanting to. Did he buy us then? Congregation, yes. And what did he buy just then? He bought us and all there was of us. And as he had, as he bought what there was of us, he bought our sins. Isaiah described it. Wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. No soundness at all. Is that so? Here's another text, Titus 3, verse 3 to 7. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, 
not by the works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us by the washing of to regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. He did it. He says so. Then do you know that it is so, congregation? Yes. Well, now let's carry that a little further. He gave himself for our sins, but the same thought goes through all. He will not take our sins, although he bought them without our permission. So just as he wouldn't um, force upon us all of the spiritual blessings, He's also not going to take our sins that he bought from us without our permission. Look at it a little further, carrying the same thought forward. He gave himself. For whose sin? Congregation, ours. Whose were they? Congregation, ours. He gave himself for them. They being ours. To whom did he give himself when he bought them? Congregation, to us. He gave himself to me for my sins. Congregation, yes. Then the choice is forever with me as to wh whether I would rather have my, my sins than to have him, isn't it? Congregation, yes. That is the living choice before me, is it? Congregation, yes. Is that the choice before you? Congregation, yes. Which would you rather have, your sins or Christ? congregation Christ. Then from this time henceforth, can there be any hesitation about letting anything go that God shows is sin? Will you let it go when it is pointed out? When sin is pointed out to you, say, I would rather have Christ than that. And let it go, congregation, amen. Just tell the Lord, Lord, I make the choice now. I make the trade. I make thee my ch choice. It is gone. I have something better. Thank the Lord. Then where in the world is the opportunity for any of us to get discouraged over our sins? Now, some of the brethren here have done that very thing. They came here free, but the Spirit of God brought up something they never saw before. The Spirit of God went deeper than it ever went before and revealed things they never saw before. And then instead of thanking the Lord that that was so, and letting the whole, whole wicked business go and thanking the Lord they had ever so much more of him than they ever had before. They began to get discouraged. They said, oh, what am I going to do? My sins are so great. There they let Satan cast a cloud over them and throw them into discouragement. And they get no good out of coming to the meetings day after day. Isn't that too bad? Isn't it too bad that a person whom the Lord has loved so much as to give himself for him at all should act that way with the Lord when the Lord wants to reveal more of himself? Brethren, if any of you have got into discouragement, let us quit. If the Lord has brought up sins to us that we never thought of before, that only shows that he is going down to the depths and he will reach the bottom at last. And when he finds the last thing that is unclean, or impure, that is out of harmony with his will, and brings that up and shows that to us, and we say, I would rather have the Lord than that, and the work is complete, and the seal of the living God can be fixed upon that character. Congregation, amen. Which would you rather have, a character? Someone in the congregation began praising the Lord, and others began to look around. Never mind. If lots more of you would thank the Lord for what you have got, there would be more joy in this house tonight. Which would you rather have? The completeness, the perfect fullness of Jesus Christ, or have less than that with some of your sins covered up that you never know of? Congregation, his fullness. But don't you see, the testimonies have told us that if there be stains of sin there, we cannot have the seal of God. How in the world can that seal of God, which is the impress of his perfect character, 
revealed in us, be put upon us when there are sins about us. He cannot put the seal, the impress of his perfect character upon us until he sees it there. And so he has got to dig down to the deep places we never dreamed of because he cannot understand, we cannot understand our hearts, but the Lord knows the heart. He tries the conscience. He will cleanse the heart and bring up the last vestige of wickedness. Let him go on, brethren. Let him keep on his searching work. And when he does bring our sins before us, let the heart say, Lord, thou gavest thyself for my sins. Oh, I take thee instead of them. They are gone, and I rejoice in the Lord. Brethren, let us be honest with the Lord and treat him as he wants us to. Then he gave himself to us for our sins. Then I say again, and you see that it is simply with you and me a living choice as to whether we will have the Lord or ourselves, the Lord's righteousness or our sins, the Lord's say or our say. Now, just to sort of interrupt Jones here for a minute. Why is it that some people, and, you know, we can include ourselves there in that list of some people because uh, there's no difference between us and others. So why is it that we sometimes in our lives choose to have our own righteousness? What is the problem there? Why would we choose our sins? Because our sins are just our righteousness, right? Our, all of our righteousness are filthy rags. So why would we choose our sin, our self-righteousness, instead of the Lord's righteousness? What, what would allow us to do that? Lack of understanding. Okay, so there's a lack of understanding on our part. That is, we must believe that our righteousness is good enough, right? And why would somebody believe that righteousness is good enough? What is it that they don't understand? Do they understand the righteousness of God? No. And, and often that's why we compare ourselves with others, right? Instead of comparing ourselves with God, we compare ourselves with others. Because we can look at someone else and we can see their faults. And then we can look at ourselves and say, well, I'm not as bad as this man is. Uh, who does that remind you of in the Bible? Who thought his own righteousness was good enough? Well, Cain. Cain okay. That. I'm thinking of the story that Christ told of the, right, the Pharisee and the publican. So the Pharisee looked at his own righteousness. You know, he, he fasted. Twice in the week, he paid tithes of all that he possessed. But he compared himself to the publican. You know, I'm thankful that I'm not like this publican. But he didn't go down to his house justified. Now, what about the publican? Did he have any righteousness to recommend himself to God? No. He said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And that is where we have to be. If we are not the publican, we have no other choice than to be the Pharisee. And yet many of us justify our sin based upon a comparison of ourselves with others rather than with Christ's righteousness. If I see Christ, if I come to know Christ and I see his righteousness, what will happen to me? What experience will I have? What, ex what, what is the example in scripture? 
Isaiah, Job, John. A humbling experience. Yeah, look, right? right. If we come to know Christ, we will see our sins. And will we want to hold on to our sins if we truly see Christ's righteousness? No. no. Because when we see Christ's righteousness, we see both justice and mercy. We see his willingness to forgive us. Can we see Christ's righteousness without seeing his willingness to forgive us? If we see Christ as, as merely holy, separate from sinners, but we don't see his mercy, have we seen Christ's righteousness? Don't we have to see all aspects of his character? Christ does not present himself as, as separate from sinners in the sense that Christ was made like us, right? He's wholly harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. But yet, he that dwelleth in the places in heaven, he dwelleth with him that is a, of a humble and a contrite spirit, correct? He dwells in the high, high and holy place but with him also of a humble and a contrite spirit. I can't remember which verse that is. Isn't that true? <clears throat> okay. So Jones goes on. He says, there's no difference in making the choice when we know what the Lord has done and what he is to us. The choice is easy. Let the surrender be complete. And when these sins come up, why, they were surrendered long ago. That is all they are brought up for, that we can make the choice. This is the blessed work of sanctification. And we can know that that work of sanctification is going on in, in us. If the Lord should take away our sins without our knowing it, what good would it do us? That would simply be making machines of us. He does not propose to do that. Consequently, he wants you and me to know when our sins go, that we may know when his righteousness comes. It is when we yield ourselves that we have him. It is true that the scriptures say we are instruments of God. And don't forget that we are always intelligent instruments, not like the instrument to pick or a shovel that a man would use. That is utterly useless. That is not it. But we are intelligent instruments. We we will we will be used by the lord in our at our own living choice our own living choice upon his side choosing that he will do that with us and then it is done because his almighty power carries on the work and then he gave himself for our sins and now he comes and says there is sin what then lord it is sin that is confession the root idea of confession is to speak the same thing. The root idea of the Greek word translated confession is to speak the same thing. That is confession. The Lord said to David, you have sinned and done this evil. David said, I have sinned. That is confession. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. What does God show them for anyway? The only thing that he shows men their sins for is that he may take them away. When he shows me sins, I say, Lord, they are sins. And what then? They are forgiven. They are gone. Now, you folks have confessed your sins since you've been here, haven't you? All that the Lord has shown you, have you? Congregation, yes, sir. Everyone who has done that, his sins are forgiven. The Lord has said so. What do you say, congregation? Amen. 
But Satan says it is not so. He is a liar. But some folks here have been saying that Satan tells them the truth upon that point. People in this house have been telling Satan that he told the truth upon that very point. Satan says they are not forgiven. And they say, no, they are not. Let us quit that. We confess our sins that they may be forgiven. And the Lord says they are forgiven. And when they are forgiven, why then in the Lord's name? Why then in the Lord's name? Let us say so. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And he received the sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had. The Lord says, come now, let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What do you say? Congregation, it is so. How do you know? Congregation, the Lord says so. Very good. Then you know that it is so, don't you? Micah 7, 19. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And that will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. And where are they? Congregation in the depths of the sea. How do you know? Congregation, he says so. Then you know that, don't you? Then how in the world is anybody going to bother you about getting your sins back to you? Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. How far are they away from you now? You have confessed them. How far are they away? Voice, as far as the east is from the west. Why don't you say so then? Satan comes and says they are not forgiven. Every sin is right there before your face. Don't you see them? Are they? Congregation, no. Says one, I have seen them there. It is nothing of the kind. Satan is a magician and can make things appear so that are not so. But you look at them and say, yes. That is so. It is not so. The Lord says they are as far from the east as from the west. They are in the depths of the sea, and they are as white as snow. Thank the Lord. Isaiah 38, 17. And that verse is the last one we need tonight. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness. But thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. How many? Congregation all. Behind his back, where are they then? Congregation, behind his back. We are before his face, and the sins are behind his back. Who is between us and them? Congregation God. And he is upon his throne, isn't he? Then when I have confessed my sins to the Lord, he and his living eternal throne stand between me and those sins. And Satan and everybody else in this universe cannot bring them back. For he has got to get the Lord and his throne out of the way before they can get those sins back to me again. And I'm going to be glad of it. Can, I, can we know these things? Can we know that we know them? How can we know that we know them? The Lord says so. When he says so, and we believe it, that is faith. Satan says, they are not. We say, I know they are. Satan says, no, they are. There they are. And we say, they are not there. They are in the depths of the sea. Voice, praise the Lord. When the man stands there, there is something that God can put his seal on. When the Lord says, thy sins are forgiven, that he has cast them behind his back, and the man will not believe it, is there anything that God can put his, is there anything there that God can put his seal on? No. Someone asked that Isaiah 43, 25 be read, which Elder Jones did. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. There are many texts like that, which we might notice. One is found in Hebrews 8.15. Their sins will I remember no more. And another in Ezekiel 33.16. None of his sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. Here the Lord says he will not remember our sins. And the Lord will never mention them. It is Satan's work to do that. Brethren, let us believe the Lord. When we believe that, then the Lord will give you and me the circumcision of the heart, the seal 
of the righteousness that we have. And he can do it because there is something there that he can put his seal upon. And when a man does that as an individual, he receives the seal of righteousness. And when we as a whole body, as a church, believe that, we can ask with perfect confidence for the outpouring of his Holy Spirit and wait patiently and confidently, knowing that it will surely come in his own good time. So I know I did a lot of reading there, not a lot of commenting, and, and not many people commented. But is there any comments about what we have read? About what Jones is saying here. I think Jones, I think Jones is pretty clear to me. Mm -hmm. Most for the most part. Mm -hmm. Now we can see how some people can take what <laughs> it says and twist it. And, and I've seen this type of thing. So, and I brought this up before. Um, the guy who wrote the book, uh, The Third Great Jihad. Um, trying to think of his name. Can't think of it. I'll think of it. Um, but I saw him at a camp meeting at, uh, in 1988. Um, uh, it was a camp meeting down in Malo, Washington. It was put on by Ty Gibson and James Rafferty. And um, he was, this guy was teaching, you know, that he hadn't seen since March. And this was in June or July, I think. Uh, must have been in July. And, um, you know, it was rather interesting. It might have been 87. Um, but anyway, um, what would be the problem with that? He was saying that we can have faith, and I just believe that because I have faith, that I haven't sinned since I claimed that promise. What would be the problem with what he was it saying? Like, it sounds kind of self-righteous to me. Okay. Yeah, so it sounds self-righteous. But what, what is he focused upon? Is he focused upon what Christ can do in him, or is he focused upon his own righteousness? Focus on, focus on, he's focused on what his, himself, what he can do. That's what it sounds like. Now, he said that he could see that he was righteous, right? So, so he hadn't seen Yeah, he focused on himself. And, and, I, and I told people before when I was there um, – at that camp meeting, that I was, that was um, a temptation was put before me because I knew that what he was teaching was error because I'd read Jones and I understood that we would see ourselves as sinners. We don't see ourselves as righteous. We see Christ as righteous. Um, but, you know, I was, I had the most pleasant um, uh, character during that camp meeting. I was the most helpful I could possibly be to my wife and to the kids and, and all the things I was doing. And I, when, I, when I looked at myself, I didn't see any sin at all, except I did see a sin. And that was the sin of self-righteousness. I knew that this was a deception that Satan was bringing upon me to get me to believe um, what this guy was teaching. And, but I knew it wasn't true. But I also knew there was some truth there that people needed to see. That is, we can trust that, that Christ is working out his salvation in us. We can trust that, but do we need to see it? Do we have to declare that we're perfect in order to believe that Christ is working in us? No. 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 No, I believe, no way. I believe that he that begun a good work in me will complete it. I can trust, in spite of what I see in myself, that Christ is working out his will. And I see my sins. I confess my sins. 
I don't trust that somehow uh, I need to be able to see myself as righteous in order to believe that, that my sins are forgiven. I don't go by my feelings. I don't have to wait to feel forgiven. I know that if I go to him, that I can trust in his word that he has forgiven me. This is the point that Jones is making. But this has often been twisted around. Even though Jones is extremely clear to a person who wants to believe that their righteousness, that they're more righteous than others, and that their righteousness is what's going to fit them for heaven, even though they may not say it that way, that they're going to compare themselves with others and look down on other people and feel that they are righteous. Those type of people, which is, is someone who has not had a revelation of Jesus Christ. He hasn't seen Christ as he truly is. And the only way that we can see Christ as he is, is to respond to the light that he gives us. Now, it's the mystery of iniquity, why some people choose to reject light and love darkness. Well, we can understand men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But if we go towards that light, if we make a choice, God is not going to withhold that his gift from any one of us. And if we confess our sins, God is not going to not take our sins from us. God will, because he has promised that he will, that if we confess our sins, he will he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we need to trust that that is so. On all this light that God has given this movement, all of the lines, all of the dates, all of the structures of prophetic chronology, all of, all of our experience in this movement is meant to reveal Christ's character to us to encourage us and give us confidence that he will do what he has promised. And we look at this movement here when he says, we can ask with perfect confidence for the outpouring of his Holy Spirit. We can trust that he will, in his, his own good time, pour out his spirit upon this movement. As a whole body as a church, but we as individuals need to come to that point. And, and there's nothing really that hinders us other than our choice. All of the things that hinder us are, are really just self. And, and what did Christ pay for us? As Joan says, all, right? And what are we worth apart from Christ? That is, what was our value? What would be our value if Christ hadn't purchased us? Would we be of any value? A garment that we have a character that's just wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. Our value is in the price that Christ has paid. He's paid an infinite price for each one of us. And we are infinitely valuable. Are we not? Yes. So I think, you know, this is a powerful message. I mean, we know what Jones is saying question is are we going to choose to believe what god's word says and are we going to then trust that god can take care of all these things that we we have no control over we can we can choose and each day and each moment we need to choose we will constantly be brought again to that choice every moment and we need to choose. We need to confess our sins. 
We need to trust that Christ will do as he has said. <clears throat> well, thanks, everyone. Um, I hope you have a blessed Sabbath. But before we uh, and to close, let's have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful. We're grateful for the Sabbath and for the trials that you have brought us through this past week and how you have revealed to us our need of you. We can see our sins and we can see how we desire those sins apart from you. We give these all to you, Lord. We ask that you can take what you have purchased, us and all of our sins, that you can take that we can take what you have offered us and that we can give you what is yours be with each person bless us on this sabbath bless us in meetings tomorrow morning with dwight's presentation and uh, the morning meetings um, and help us to to choose help us to see our need of you we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.